Matthew, the 16th chapter, um, verse number 13. <clears throat> it is time for Atlanta to know what church is in their Bible. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist. Some Elias and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But who say ye that I am? I am. And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood have not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven, and I say unto thee, thou, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. For those of you who need a title for this uh, sermon, it would simply be the church that's in your Bible. The church that's in your Bible. I want to suggest to you that one of the most misunderstood words of the Bible is this word church. It's a simple word. It is used redundantly throughout religious circles. But it's a misunderstood word. And what we want to do for the next few weeks is try to provide some clarity in regards to what is the church. And not only what is the church, but properly do our best to identify what the church that Jesus built looks like so you can know it when you find it. There's a lot of folk looking for a church, but you got to know what you're looking for before you know that you found the right church. And what I want to help you do on the next few weeks is just help you to understand that there is in fact a church in the Bible and that church is the church of Christ. When I say church of Christ, I simply mean it's the church that belongs to Jesus. And there is a church that belongs to Jesus and then there are churches that do not belong to Jesus. And I want you to be clear on today that you have to understand what the concept of church is in the Bible, the word of God. Now, now, many times you'll hear people say, as they use this word, they'll say, I'm going to church. Or you hear people say, I got saved and I'm going to find a church. But if you really understand the word church, then you will understand that you don't find a church necessarily. But when a man gets saved, God puts him in the church. There is no such thing as joining the church of your choice. When a man gets saved, God adds him to the church. And you have to understand today that it is impossible to separate the concept of the church from the concept of salvation. Because when a man gets saved, it is by that same process that he becomes a member of the church. So many people today are confused about the word church. So let me start by giving you a definition. When we say church, the word church is from a Greek term, ekklesia. Now, ekklesia by etymology means called out. Now, I want to help even those of us in the body of Christ because we have not necessarily uh, done this word justice. The word by etymology means called out. But that's not its usage in the scripture. Its usage in the scripture is assembly. 
So the word by etymology, let me explain etymology. You start using big words and don't explain it, folk. You know, it's almost like speaking in tongues. So you need to interpret this thing. Etymology simply means the breakdown of the word. So when you break down ecclesia, you have two words, ek and klesia. Ek meaning out of and klesia meaning called. So by etymology or through the breakdown of the word itself, it's called out. But the way it is used in scripture is that it describes an assembly. Now, if you need scripture for that, in Acts 19, 32, you'll find where there was a large mob out there who was giving Paul some problems. And the Bible refers to them as an ecclesia, that is an assembly. So when Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my church, he was saying, I will build my assembly. Now, what is the concept of that word? It means that a summons goes out. And when the summons goes out, is calling people to a gathering. That's the idea of church. So when Jesus said, upon this rock, I'll build my church, he's saying, I will build my assembly. Now, when we're talking about the church, the church is not a physical building. The church is not brick and mortar. And many times, people choose churches based on the ambiance of the building. And some people will pass by this church and go to that church because they like the building better. I've come today to tell you that the building has nothing to do with the biblical concept of the church. Absolutely nothing. And there's a lot of people in the religious world saying, well, I'm going to find me a church. And they, and they look for the nicest building they can find. I've come today to tell you that's not a sure way to know whether or not that's the right church. Now, there's nothing wrong with large buildings in as much as there's nothing wrong with a small building. Uh, praise God. As a matter of fact, there is nothing wrong with worshiping under a tree because it's not the building. The church in the Bible, as a matter of fact, didn't hardly worship in nice facilities. You have to understand when we're talking about the church, we are talking about people. Now, who's the church? It's those people who have obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. When a man obeys the gospel, God summons him into his assembly. Are y'all found that on today? So that's the concept of church. And the Bible says, upon this rock, I'll build my church. That is, Jesus was saying, I will build my assembly. Now, a lot of folk in the religious world today, the reason they can't find the right church is because they got wrong definitions. Start with a right definition. Well, what's the right definition? It means assembly and is referring to building, not, a, not uh, is referring to people, not a building. So understand the first thing you got to get out of your mind when you're thinking about the word church is the idea of a physical structure. It is a group of people that have been summoned by Christ into his spiritual assembly. Are y'all find that on today? That's definition of church. And if you start with that, you're starting on the right track. So Jesus said, upon this rock I'll build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now, I want to show you three things in the text. Can we go to school for a few minutes? Three things in the text. Three things right there in Matthew 16, 18. Number one, I want to show you the foundation of the church. The next thing I want to show you is the formation of the church. And then the third thing I want to show you is the fortification of the church. All right there in the Bible. Upon this rock foundation, I will build my church formation. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Fortification. Three concepts right there in the Bible. I want to deal with all three of them, and we're not going to leave this context. First thing we got to deal with is the foundation of the church. Because the church has a foundation. And you need to understand the assembly. That is, the called out assembly that Jesus is going to establish, which is a people, will be built on a solid foundation. And we need to find out what is the foundation. Now, why is that important, Brother Hayworth? Because in the field of religion, there are some people who would take the position that the church was built on Peter. I want to clarify that. Uh, because some people, the text says upon this rock, or rather says thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. And there is a religious group that believes 
that Peter is the first pope on the basis of this passage. Now, I'm going to tell you, it's about power and politics. What some people try to do in a specific religion is they try to give credence to the pope today by saying popes can trace their lineage back to Peter. And they use this verse to show a couple of things. They use this verse to show Peter was the primary apostle, not so. And then they show that Peter, uh, the church was built on the foundation of Peter. That also is not so. So what I want to show you in this passage, what is the foundation? Well, the first thing Jesus does in verse 13, he says, whom do men say that I the son of man am? Can I do a little bit of this now? Are we going to slow this down? Jesus is at the coast of Caesarea Philippi. He is not in Judea. He's not in Galilee. He is far from Jewish territory. Caesarea Philippi is a Gentile district. Now, he takes his apostles to a Gentile district district where in the district they worship the god of Pan of which the city before that was called Panion but they changed the name Philip changed the name to uh, Caesarea Philippi Caesarea gives honor to the to the to the Caesar who was in rule Tiberius Caesar and Philippi of course comes from Philip so he changed it to Caesarea Philippi now this is a gent Tile district far from the Jews he's not in a Jewish community he's not in Galilee he's not in Judea he's in a Gentile area now in this Gentile area where they worship idols he makes an announcement that I will build my church or my assembly Jesus makes this statement at a time when the Jews were God's assembly. Showing the Jews that a day is going to come when you will no longer be God's assembly. And I'm going to build a new assembly. And I made my announcement in a Gentile district. Which means Jesus is showing when I build my church, my church will not be made up of just Jews, but it will include people of all ethnicities. Now, when it comes to the foundation of the church, here's what happens. If you want to know which is the right foundation, how do you know what's the right foundation? Well, Jesus at the coast of Caesarea Philippi, his concern is whom do men? Say that I the son of man am. Some say thou art John the Baptist. Some say thou art Elias. Some say you are Jeremiah or maybe one of the prophets. And then finally he said, well, you know, that ain't really my concern. Whom do you say? You watch me change water into wine. Whom do you say? You watch me walk on the surface of water. Whom do you say? You saw me feed 5,000 with, 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 with two fish and five loaves of bread. Whom do you say? You, you watch me. Will you watch me fix crooked bodies and unstop deaf ears? Whom do you say? You remember when I was in the boat with you and you saw me tell a storm, peace, be still. Whom do you say? That I am the son of man am. And Peter said, thou art the Christ. Son of the living God. And Jesus said flesh and blood didn't reveal it to you. But my father which art in heaven. You are Petros. And upon this Petros. I will build my church. The word Peter. Means. Stone. Petros. But the word Petros. Means large. Foundation stone. He uses two different 
Greek terms to describe Peter as opposed to the rock that he's talking about. Peter is a rock, but he's not the large foundational stone. We got to find out in the context, what rock is he referring to? Well, Peter just said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And so the rock that the church is built on is not Peter, but on the confession that he made. What well, what was the confession? Thou art the Christ, son of the living God. And Christ is the foundation. Now, if Peter is the foundation, then Jesus built the church on a sinful man. If he could build it on Peter, he could build it on me. Can't be. Theologically, it can't be that he would build the church on a sinful man. Christ built the church on himself. He is the foundation of the church. Well, let's get it in plain English. Uh, uh, Brian, get me 1 Corinthians 3 and, and begin reading in verse number 10. Because... Because, of course, theologically and grammatically, I could prove Petros and Petros, two different things. One means stone. The other means large foundational stone. He's saying, you're Peter, and upon this rock, what rock rock are you talking about? What you just confessed. What you just confessed is that thou, I am the Christ, son of the living God. Now, that's the context. Now, what I'm going to do is get other verses that prove that conclusion. Because you may say, Brother Haywood, I don't know nothing about Petros, Petros, or any other os or os. So why don't you give this to me in plain English? Let, well, watch Paul. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 10 says what, Brian? According to the grace of God. According to the grace of God. Which is given unto me. Which is given unto me. As a wise builder. As a wise builder. I have laid the foundation. I have laid the foundation. And another buildeth thereon. And on. another buildeth thereon. But let every man. But every man. Take heed how take he Take heed how he build. Thereupon. Go and read. For other foundation. For other foundation. Can no man can lay. Can no man lay. That is laid. That is laid. Which is Jesus Christ. Which is. You don't need no Petros Petras. Paul said no other foundation can any man lay than that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Christ is the foundation of the church. Let me give it to you prophetically. Get me Isaiah chapter 28, verse 16. Isaiah 28 and verse number 16. Let's get it prophetically. Yeah. Isaiah 28, 16. Watch, watch. Isaiah talk about Jesus six, seven, six or seven hundred years prior to Jesus coming on the scene. Read. Therefore, thus Therefore, saith the Lord. Thus God, saith the Lord. Behold, behold, I lay in Zion. I lay in Zion. For a foundation. For a foundation. A stone. Stone. A tried, tried stone, stone. A precious cornerstone. Precious cornerstone. A sure foundation. A sure foundation. Read. He that believeth. He that believeth shall not make haste. Now get me Acts four. Now get me Acts four, beginning in verse ten. What are you doing, Brother Haywood? I'm trying to show you who is the foundation of the church. And it's not Peter. And as a matter of fact, it ain't no man. It ain't nobody could be the foundation. Of the church. I couldn't be the foundation of the church. You could not build the church on my morality or on my power. No, 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 no. Only Christ. Watch him, watch him, Max. Chapter 4 and verse number 10 read. Be it known unto you. Be it known unto you. And to all the people of Israel. And to all the people of Israel. That by the name of Jesus that Christ. By the of name Nazareth, of Jesus of Nazareth. Whom you crucified. Whom you crucified. Whom God raised from the dead. Whom God raised from the dead. Even by him. Even by man, him does this man stand here before you. Go home. ahead and read. This is the stone. This is the stone. Which was set at naught. Which is set at naught. Of you builders. Of you builders. Which has become which the has head. Which has become the head. Of the corner. Read. Neither is there salvation. Neither is there salvation. In any other. In any other. For there is none there other is name. There is no other name. Under heaven. Under heaven. Given among men. Given among men. Whereby we whereby must. Whereby you must. Be saved. Be saved. Christ is the foundation of the church. He is the stone that they prophesied would come. And he is the foundation of the church. So when we're talking about the foundation of the church, Christ is the foundation. And we are resting upon the resurrected Savior. The church is built on his redemptive work. And you've got to understand there is no other foundation that any man could lay. So if you're going to be in the right church, I would not be in a church 
whose foundation is somebody as sinful as you. That's wrong church. Because no sinner can be the foundation. And I know Peter was a sinner. I mean, I know it. Don't let, you, don't let me pull this list because I don't like pulling out folk lists of sins. But Peter has some, he could not be the foundation of the church. Christ is the only foundation. Not only is there a foundation, but I want you to understand, I want you to see the formation. Foundation, Christ, I will, uh, upon this rock, I will build my church. Then he says, in intake, what we see with formation is that I will build. Christ would lead in the formation of his church. It begs the question, how does Christ build his church? Well, he doesn't do it by calling a construction company. It's not how he builds a church. How does he build? How does Christ build the church? And a lot of people don't understand this. Christ builds the church. But how does he build it? How do we have the formation of the church? I told you the word church means an assembly. And the legal term of of calling an assembly includes sending out a summons. The way Christ summons you into the assembly is by the calling of the gospel. I'm going to tell y'all up front, God doesn't call no other way except by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, we got a lot of folk in the religious world claiming God called them, uh, but, but they ain't talking about the gospel. God talked to me yesterday and called me and told me that I was going to be saved right now today. And, and I'm just so glad the Lord talked to me. Lord ain't talking to folk like that today. No, 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 no. God is calling. He is sending out a summons. But the summons is the gospel. Mark chapter 16, 15. He says, go preach the gospel. Why, Jesus? Because that's my summons. Hit me 2 Thessalonians 2. Yes, sir. Second, Second Thessalonians 2, beginning in verse number 13. What does it say? But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you. We are bound God to give thanks you. always. Read. Brethren, beloved of the Lord. Read. Because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the spirit. Go ahead, and read. And belief of the truth. Read. Whereunto he called you. Uh, whereunto he did what? He called you. Uh, what did he do? He called you. How does he call? By our gospel. Now, now. God calls. He's still calling folk today, but he calls by the gospel. If you're going to get in God's assembly, you've got to answer his summons. And the summons is the call of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's the only way a man becomes a member of God's assembly. It's the only way a man becomes a member of the church. As a matter of fact, when a man obeys the gospel, it's by that same process he becomes a member of the church. You don't get saved and then find a church later. You get saved and God adds you to the church. Ain't no such thing as joining. Uh, I, let me figure out what church I'm going to join. Who told you that you choose that? That's a misconception in religion. Is that I get saved and then I go find a church that pleases me. No, you got to find the church that pleases God. And that's following God's prerequisites. And you must find, and the only way, if I didn't go no further, the, the way you know you in the church or not is did you answer the calling? If I didn't do nothing else, if I didn't identify the church, which I will do, but if you didn't know nothing else, in, in part one of this series, what you need to know is the only way you get in the church is by obeying the calling. Yes, living my faith.
trust and pray that the message you just heard from the West End Church of Christ was uplifting and edifying. We invite you to come and worship with us. We are located at 1303 Ralph David Abernathy Boulevard, Atlanta, Georgia, 30310. We meet every Sunday at 8 a.m., 1045 a.m., and 6 p.m. worship services. We have Bible study classes every Sunday at 9.45 a.m., Tuesday at 7 p.m., and on Wednesdays at 10 a.m. and 7.30 p.m. For more information or to order a copy of today's service,